I'm Vioni Dimel. This is Boston Lanka News, bringing you news, views and entertainment from Boston and USA. For this edition, we joined with Dr. Dayan Jayatilaka, who is a political scientist, author and who served Sri Lanka as a diplomat. Uh, Dr. Jayatilaka, uh, you have gone on record saying that after eradicating terrorism and winning the war, Sri Lanka lost a rare opportunity to establish a permanent peace. Could you elaborate on that? Yes, I did say that because when the war was won in May 2009, Sri Lanka was resurrected or reborn, depending on your religious uh, matrix, as a country. It could also have been a moment of refounding. It could have been uh, a moment such as that uh, the United States went through after the Union forces won uh, the civil war against uh, the forces of uh, the Confederacy. But uh, that has so far not been the case. In May 2009, we were the beneficiaries and in fact the architects of two supportive consensuses. One was the broad national support uh, in favor of the military victory, in favor of the triumph over terrorism. And those of you in Boston who underwent uh, the recent uh, experience would know exactly what that would mean in Sri Lanka, where we had uh, many more such experiences every week for years and years, for decades. So there was a supportive consensus. There was also a broadly supportive international consensus as evidenced in the vote we secured uh, in the same month, 10 days after the war, in Geneva in 2009. Now, the national consensus stands, but in, in a certain way it is frayed at the edges because of certain problems of governance. For instance, uh, the arrest uh, of uh, General Sarah Fonseca, the impeachment crisis, uh, and other such issues which has led to um, a slightly greater number of citizens being uh, more open to the idea of international pressure than in 2009 when there was a solid and broad support against any kind of international intrusion or, or scrutiny. But still the domestic consensus stands. The international consensus has broken down, which is why we we lost the votes in 2012 and 2013 in Geneva, and if things go the way they are, I'm rather pessimistic, I'm afraid, about 2014, which is going to be quite crucial. Now, we could have done it differently. We have the uh, Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission's report and recommendations. That could have been a manifesto and a roadmap for post-war Sri Lanka. Uh, the government could have prioritized and fast-tracked that. It has been ambiguous about the LLRC recommendations. Uh, we don't seem to have learned the right lessons from the fact that we had a 30 years war. Now, I'm happy, very happy, that we won the war. But I'm very sad that we ever had to fight one. And we must avoid that kind of situation. The way we could do that is to understand and admit the mistakes that all sides made in the run-up to the war and also during the war. Now, we have not been of that disposition. The government, which should have taken the leadership because after all, they have been elected to lead the country. Our leaders have not shown the vision that uh, a statesman or, uh, should. So therefore, there has not been a healing vision, an, an idea of a new social contract uh, which would have led to a genuine reconciliation between the constituent communities that make up uh, the citizenry of our island. So I, I think uh, we won the war. We have not yet won the peace. We are in danger of losing the peace. We have not yet lost the peace. So there is still a chance to make a course correction. Uh, you are one of the key people who played a crucial role in building international support against LTT. Do you think uh, Sri Lankan foreign policy is heading the right direction in the post-war Sri Lanka? 
Well, I don't, I, I don't think we have a foreign policy. Uh, and this is not being flippant because uh, I, I see completely contradictory thrust statements, initiatives, um, personalities who contradict each other, the same person who contradicts himself or herself. Uh, so I don't see a policy. For instance, let me give you a, a crucial example. Um, I, I, I read a, a piece on, on, on a Washington blog by uh, our ambassador to Washington, which concluded in the United States, they say the bottom line is what comes. The bottom line is that Sri Lanka is, is willing and, and ready to be a geopolitical and strategic ally of the United States pivot to Asia. Now, we know that the pivot to Asia uh, is part of the competition uh, between the United States and China. And it is really to do with the Asia-Pacific region, though the Indian Ocean has now also been brought into it. Now, um, we also rely on China and the Security Council. And now, uh, our, the governor of our central bank, Mr. Ajit Nimad Cabral, reiterated, uh, reiterated this um, in, uh, in an article in Forbes magazine, which uh, said that, um, yes, we are willing to play this role. Now, at the same time, Top officials of the government of Sri Lanka, actually members of, of the same family, really, uh, say that, look, we don't have to worry about what the United States says, uh, because uh, all the United States can do is not to give us some military scholarships, and, and we have China on our side anyway, so why worry about the United States? Um, so these are two entirely contradictory and equally erroneous I might say, equally erroneous uh, statements. I, I, you know, if one of the two statements were, were wise, uh, then at least you could say somebody's getting it right some of the time. But uh, I, I don't think we have a foreign policy. I think we have, uh, in terms of security policy, we have paranoia. And in terms of foreign policy, we have schizophrenia. We have been hearing about government's plans uh, to have the Northern Province elections in September. What are your views about the 13th Amendment? Uh, some say it was forced upon us by India and it's not the best solution for Sri Lanka for devolution of powers. What's your views? Well, uh, it, 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 was, it was forced upon Sri Lanka in this sense because it was the byproduct, the inevitable byproduct, the child of the Indo-Sri Lanka Accord and the Indian intervention. And it was an intervention in 87. Um, one must also remember that the 13th Amendment itself was presented to the Parliament by uh, the most patriotic leader we had up until Mahindra Rajapaksa, and that's by Rana Singh and Premadas as Prime Minister. Now, Premadasa didn't do that merely because he was Prime Minister and J.R. Jawadan told him to, because the same Rana Singh and Premadas as Prime Minister refused. He and Lalit Atulat Mughali did not attend the signing ceremony of the Indo-Sri Lanka Accord and did not attend the reception, uh, which was uh, hosted for Rajiv Gandhi. So, Premadasa was very clear. Uh, but he is the one who introduced the 13th Amendment to Parliament. Now, it is said that um, the MPs were bussed into hotels and kept under guard. That's true. But that was because the JVP was killing MPs. I mean, it had rolled a grenade into uh, the Parliament. Uh, on, on one occasion and, and killed Lionel Jayatilaka uh, and wounded uh, Lalita Atulad Mughali. So, uh, the, uh, it was not in order to get their signatures that they were kept in, in hotels. Um, it must also be remembered that at the presidential election of 1988, Madam Sribao Manonayaka and Prime Minister Premadasa presented their manifestos. Both of them said that they would call for the withdrawal of the Indian peacekeeping forces. But only one of them said that she would scrap the 13th Amendment, and that was Madam Sinbhavu Banunai. Prime Minister Premadasa did not do so. He won. And in fact, uh, he was greeted uh, during his campaign by the then, by the newly appointed uh, Chief Minister of the Northern Provincial Council. Uh, there was later a crisis, but that was one and a half years after that, in 1990. Uh, so, the, the provincial councils 
uh, were yes the 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 product of uh, external coercion but why was that uh, could, how could that have been prevented uh, my point is that if sri lanka had implemented any of the um, proposals and agreements for devolution before that there would not have been an opening for anybody to intervene and i i, I go back especially to the Bandaranaika Chalvanayagam Pact of 1957. Mr. Bandaranaika, who was the architect of Singhala only, uh, one year later signed a pact with Chalvanayagam for what was essentially provincial councils. They were called regional councils, which were smaller than the province, but they had the power to amalgamate across provincial boundaries. So it's pretty much the same thing as the 13th Amendment. And he was forced to withdraw that, and he won that there would be rivers of blood as a result of uh, the, the, the forcible abrogation, which he, was, which he felt he had to undertake, uh, of the Bandaranaika Chalvanagan Pact. So if we had had the Bandaranaika Chalvanagan Pact in 57, and the architect of that, Mr. Bandaranaika, was probably the most educated leader that Sri Lanka has ever had, uh, you know, in the 20th and, and now the 21st centuries. Um, we would not have been in that situation in 87, 30 years later. There were other proposals for um, devolution. The All Parties Conference uh, of 1984, which was summoned by President Jawadala. The Political Parties Conference of, of June 86, at which President Jawadala uh, promised, and, and this is not purely verbal because the government press printed all these documents, uh, promised to implement provincial level devolution june 26th i believe 1986 if those had been implemented or if those leaders had been permitted to implement them um, then there would have been no opening for india to intervene the fundamental point i'm making is very simple i mean john f kennedy uh, said this when he was president and there was a wave of revolutions after Cuba in uh, Latin America and John F. Kennedy understood and he said that those who make reform impossible make revolution inevitable. So similarly, those who block or indefinitely delay the necessary internally generated structural reform only make inevitable externally imposed reform. Uh, this is true of societies down the ages. Either it comes from bottom up or it is imposed from top down. This is true of economics, it's true of uh, devolution, it's true of anything else. Uh, if there cannot be a, a normal birth, there's a caesarean delivery. If the reform does not come from within, it will come from outside. Uh, so I would, and, and those of you who are in the United States, you know how effective the secessionist networks in the Tamil diaspora are in terms of lobbying. You know how far ahead they are of, of the Sri Lankan side. Uh, I would say that the 13th Amendment and implementing the Northern Provincial Council uh, is risky, but on balance it is a far lesser risk than not doing so and be seen not to do so. Um, it is probably the cheapest price that we will have to pay. Because every time we have delayed this uh, sort of reform, the next time around, the price has been higher. Never lower. Never lower. It has always been higher. So if we don't do this now, the price may exceed uh, the structure of a unitary state. It might even exceed the boundaries of a united Sri Lanka. So I would say be realistic um, and let's get this done and let's manage this. It's problematic. But politics is about managing problems. Let's manage this uh, as fairly and prudently as we can. Because the world is watching. The world is watching. If we don't do this, it's going to confirm the view that the Sri Lankan government, state and indeed the Sinhalese are just not willing to have any kind of political dialogue and reconciliation, any kind of reform um, in relation to the Tamil minority. 
So uh, that's that's not smart. Uh, Dr. Jayatilaka, we have seen you in some public protest campaigns. You have begun to speak for human rights, media freedom more openly. At one point, you were very supportive of the government. So what's the change now? Well, when I was serving as ambassador in Geneva, um, there are uh, three terms that you never heard me uh, say or speak. And everything I said is really uh, is on YouTube. I mean, I didn't put it there, but it's on YouTube. I never use the term humanitarian operation. I never use the term zero civilian casualties or zero civilian casualties policy because I never believed it. I mean, I, it would have been good if that had been the case. I, I don't think it was. And I never once used the term Mahinda Chintana. The only time I used it was about two weeks ago when I said that the so-called Mahinda Chintana seems to now be increasingly overrun by Gota Chintana. But when I was ambassador, I never once used any of those three terms. I never defended anything that I thought was wrong. So you never heard me defending um, the killing of the Trink of Hive students, the execution of the Mutu, the 17 ACF aid workers, the murder of Lasanta Vikramatunga. I didn't even try to contextualize or provide the usual excuses. Um, while ambassador, I wrote a signed article which appeared in the island condemning the murderers of Lasanta Vikramatunga as fascists. And when as ambassador, um, the, uh, I, I was invited for a meeting which was chaired by Amnesty International and featured uh, Dr. Uh, Manoharan, the, the father of Ragidhar, who was one of the five students murdered in Trinkamali. And he made this presentation. There were those uh, in the hall who probably expected me, given my reputation, to try to repudiate or contradict him. The only thing I did was get up from my seat. And then Rajiv was also seated next to me, and walk across the hall and shake hands and commiserate with Dr. Manohar and wish him the best of luck in his efforts to bring justice to the perpetrators of this crime, which uh, robbed him of his son. So that was my record as the ambassador. That is also why we were able to get, uh, that is one of the reasons that I spoke with credibility and with, with some sense of ethics that we were able to convince so many countries to vote for us. I mean, this was also one of the factors that went into the mix. You must always hold the moral high ground. Now, of course, I'm even more outspoken because I no longer have to operate uh, within the parameters, though I had stretched those parameters myself uh, while, while I was functioning as ambassador. Uh, I, I, am, I am, of course, uh, now as a, as a civilian out of uniform, um, I am... Um, I'm freer in, in expressing my views. But it is also because I saw the trends deteriorating, the trends moving in the way that they're moving, that I served my basic term as ambassador to France, two-year term, and refrained from engaging in the standard practice of requesting uh, one more year, that's a third year. So um, ambassadors were not uh, career foreign service people, this, they have a two-year term, but then they just make a request for the third year. And though Paris is probably my uh, my favorite city in the world, it used to be New York, but now it's Paris. Uh, I did not, I chose not to request that extension. And in fact, I wrote to the foreign minister and said, my term is over in three months. Um, I, I want to I want to come back. So um, I'm now more outspoken than I was, but there is a basic continuity between what I said and did as ambassador and what I'm saying now. In Geneva, and the members of our delegation would know um, those who were there, Rajiva, Shirani Gunatilaka, the AG's department, and my staff, <coughs> excuse me, would know that from 2007 I said two things when I got there. One, they're going to come at us through Geneva. This is uh, Thermopylae. I said, did you watch the movie 300, uh, even if you haven't read Herodotus, uh, the histories which uh, deal with uh, the battle that the Spartans waged against uh, one and a half million Persians. But if you saw the movie, 300, you know what I'm talking about. They are going to come for us here because they cannot come for us through New York. Uh, we have the Chinese and the Russians and the Security Council, and we currently have the numbers in the General Assembly. The only place they can come for us is where there is no veto, and they will come for us as the war escalates and as we move to the victory. That was the first point I made to my staff as I went there at the staff meeting. And I kept reiterating this every year. The second point was this. 
and don't let me hear one of two things. I mean, don't let me hear that you didn't defend our country against unfair criticisms from any quarter. If you're in the hall, you respond. You don't need my instructions. You respond. Two, do not ever say anything against your conscience. I never did, and I didn't expect my staff or uh, the delegates uh, to do so. So I think I have remained or tried, tried as best as I could to remain ethically consistent uh, in, in the stance that I've taken from the time I was ambassador in 2007 right through to today. But of course, I'm now far freer in my expression of my criticism. That concludes our news edition. We meet you again with another news edition of news, views and entertainment from Boston and USA. Till then, goodbye.